going to talk about all this, the, the Gnome file manager. I'm going to describe a bit what it is, some of the ideas behind it, uh, some of the history. And then I'm going to put deeper into technical details of uh, how we manage I.O. And then I'll go into uh, how you, as, as a third party developer, can extend all this. So we'll start with what it is. I mean, the easiest way to describe it is to say it's, it's the file manager for the GNOME desktop. But really, there's, there's like this mission behind it that makes it more than the file manager. The original vision that the ESOL people, or like the original people had, was to have a universal viewer. Better if you were in uh, a TS talk this morning, Kitty has a similar idea with Comfort. So basically, the, the file manager would just be a shell that, that displays location and lets you navigate to other locations. And then all, all, the, all the thing in the middle of the window, use their own plugins that depend on the type of file you're displaying. So we would have a couple of folder views by default. And we also have like displays for posting files and images and various other types of files. But over time, it became obvious that this wasn't really a good way. I mean, it, it's very nice conceptually, maybe from a design standpoint, but it's not very useful. People do really want to use read applications to view files. They don't really understand the difference between suddenly something opens in a new window that looks completely different and sometimes it appears in, in the normal file manager window. So really what the, the current vision for Nolis is, is, is to focus on just main, managing the day-to-day -day managing files. And maybe not you know, the extreme deep hierarchies, but how you open files, how you browse your files, and conceptually, it shouldn't be an application that you launch when you want to look at files, but it should be a part of the desktop experience. It should always be there, and it should be the file system. The way you think of a folder should be, you should think of the window with the items in it. That's the folder, right? It's not, it's not, it's not this app that displays the file system, but, but the window is the file system. And we want it to be easy to use, even though that sometimes this comes as a cost and a loss of power. We believe that simplicity sometimes triumphs over extreme power and flexibility. So, so the history of all this starts with ESOL. It's a company founded in 1999. Francisco, who wanted to do their own work. So they started doing the file manager, because that's what we did have a file manager at the time called you know, Midnight Commander. But it was based on the Midnight Commander code base, which didn't work really well in the UI, because the, the, the internal design it just didn't work well in a typical event based UI app. So they started rewriting or writing a new. Pub manager about the end of 1999. And then a year or so later, finally got Nolis 1.0 released. And uh, then Gnome 1.4, which is the first Gnome with, with Nolis and uh, Nolis stack. About this time, my first work on Nolis is committed. It's a JPEG thumbnailing performance fix. But actually, it's somewhat interesting. The first time I heard about all this was back in 1999, where I was working in, in a company in Sweden doing embedded Linux work. So I was working with Silva. And Romero from Netscape approached me and asked me if I was interested in working for this new company who was doing this really cool file manager. And I was like, file manager? No, I don't think so. So I ended up not doing that. Which is sort of interesting, given that I now maintain it. 
Anyway, shortly after the, the first release, I mean, in May 2001, 103, which was the, the final release from ESOL, was released because they, they had to shut down because of lack of funding. However, a lot of the people at ESOL, uh, mainly Barry, who was the main architect and maintainer, kept working on it far, far longer than that. So even after it was shut down, he was working on moving on to a port and all sorts of stuff. So this is where I come in. By this time, I had joined Red Hat, and we were doing work in Red Hat Linux 7.2, which was the first release that had been one four and the whole lot of stack. So we were doing lots of work in it, performance work, mainly instability work, and uh, it ended up being me doing most of the work in it and, and working with Aaron to get stuff back stream, back on stream. And as Darren started talking about moving to other things, he asked me to join him, so we both maintained it for a while. Uh, and eventually I took over. He moved to back to Apple. To, uh, he ended up doing Safari actually. So. Uh, but then OS 2 o was released. This is about the time No. 2 o was released too. It was, it was basically the same app as all this one, but it was moved to a completely different platform, which helped a lot in that we could trim away a lot of extra features that we had to implement. For instance, like Nova's 1.0 had a data text, but it was done in a way that was not, it was not in GTK, but it had special case and those codes. So we could drop a lot of code. It was just a better release. And since then, we've had regular releases every six months, with a regular uh, GNOME schedule. And there's been a couple of major changes since then. In September 2004, Dave merged the well-known spatial mode branch, which I'm sure some of you hate, and kill me later. Uh, and now recently, I uh, landed the Nova Slate branch which removes the final use of Nobo in the user interface and thus finally kills this whole original universal browser idea. Even though we, we did remove that idea from the user interface a lot earlier, but, but now it's, it's, not, it's no longer about the internal web assignment. And uh, very recently we got a new maintainer, both Dave and I are sort of busy with other stuff, so we needed more people to work on viewing patches and whatnot. So, as we see, as we saw, there has been a lot of changes in this, both in the platform it's based on and, uh, and the UI. But there's one part of the list that we, as always, been the same. I'll call it the Nolis IO model, which is the basic way that Nolis works uh, doing file IO. So Nolis is a single thread level application. Actually it's not, but the user interface part it is really single threaded. So all windows are displayed by the same thread. So you can't, you can't do any blocking IO calls in the main thread. So we have to do all I.O. asynchronous uh, and we do all I.O. using GNOME EFS, which is a kind of library that abstracts file access. So the whole sort of stack where at the top we have the actual application, which uses a sort of internal abstraction that helps abstract away the asynchronousness of, of the GNOME EFS async operation layer which in turn uses a set of modules that implement various protocols and file systems, such as file, the Unix file, file system, FTP, or Samba. And I'll go through all these layers, starting from the bottom. You know, VFS is basically a file system abstraction, quite similar to the, to the virtual file system in the kernel. <laughs> It uses 
your eyes instead of our lamps. In the first part, the VGRI is sort of the protocol, so each, each protocol is implemented by its own shared library module. And that, we call them the VGRI method, and each method implements a set of POSIX likes operation. Typical, I mean, it is very much like normal syscall in Unix. We have open read, write close for normal file operation. Get file info is very similar to stat. We have uh, directory meeting operations, and this is uh, some other uh, operations too. Right? And this is the way, if you're implementing a method, these are sort of APIs you're implementing. Where for, for open read close, you can sort of get, get uh, the open call gets URI and some other arguments, and what it does, it generates a method handle that is, contains some internal information for the operation, and then it returns that to the caller. And every time the caller wants to read something, uh, you, you, get, you get the handle passed, and you get buffer that you want to put to fill in. Uh, you know, we have resolved some sort of generic error code, it's like a pair code, but it's not uh, a separate variable. So these are very, these are synchronous calls, so if you call read, it will block down until it read some amount of bytes. And that might be sort of slow, if you're, if you're doing an FTP call system, it might even like even if you're using a normal Unix file system, it could be on NFS and block forever. So we can't really use this in all this itself. So there's a, the asynchronous NFS operation, which is, which is a layer built on top of these. Uh, so for instance, the asynchronous open call, instead of it, 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 it blocking, you, you, you pass it a callback and it returns immediately. But eventually, the operation will finish and you get callback and you get the results from the callback or in the callback from the operation. And the way this works internally is that when you call GNOMEFS async open, it creates a, a job object and queues it on the queue. queue. And then there's a, there's a set of worker thread that always, whenever they're free, they pick the, 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 the most prioritized job and executes that. And uh, when, when it's done, it uses the glib main loop and the handling system to pass an event to the main loop where it can call back to the original. Um, it, it calls the app, the, the app to my callback. And there's also support for canceling jobs, so if you're no longer interested in a long-running job, you can just cancel it and you won't be called anymore. But this is sort of complicated to handle. So to make it easier to implement all this, we have an underlayer layer abstraction called Knowledge File, which provides a much easier way to handle asynchronous I.O., at least from the perspective of, of doing a user interface for it. So the way, you work, the way it works is you ask for an old file object for your URI. And so you, and you get this object, you can just call and ask it for whatever data you want. So say you want the size, you just call get size. However, if the first time you called it, it didn't know anything about the file, it would just return that I don't know anything, I don't know the size. So what you do then is say you would say you want to display the file or the file size in a dialog. Then you would register a monitor of the file saying I'm, I'm interested in these attributes, the, the file size attribute. And whenever the state changes in the file, you will get a callback so you can update your label, display a new size. So initially you just display nothing. But when you uh, register the monitor, it will start the I.O. and eventually get a callback. Uh, it will update the, the label and maybe later some sort of I.O. happens, so the file size changes. 
then you will get another callback. So you can always keep the latest uh, information on the screen. And there's also a one-off thing called Colvin Ready. So sometimes you have a different sort of usage. Maybe, for instance, you want the type of a file so that you know what to do to launch it. So you click on a file. You want to know what type it is. So you register a Colvin Ready. And Whenever all this knows what the type is, it will call you and then you can do something and will never get called again. And it ends up that this file is actually the way caching is handled internally because whenever you ask for a file for the specific URI, you always get back the same object. So the this file object itself caches information for as long as it lives. This means that whenever you do some sort of IO to a file, and all IO to files, and all this is done through all the file, no, this file objects. So whenever you do something, you also have to invalidate. Like if you, if you rename something, you have to invalidate the name attributes on the on the, on the novel file object. Uh, because otherwise, you can easily end up with state uh, your caches. And there's also a similar object called Nolus directory, which basically keeps a list of, of Nolus files which are in, 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 in the directory. So you get callbacks like files added, files removed. And each window displaying in a directory basically keeps around the Nolus directory, and thus all the Nolus files in the directory. And this, and this is the basic caching that always does. So I want to talk a bit about extending all this. I mean, anybody can like hack all this and send me a patch. You might take it, or maybe not. But what I'm more interested in is external third-party extensions, uh, meaning that it's something that's not shipped to the core all this part. And this is interesting because it lets people experiment with stuff that you know, people might not be ready for yet. I might want to like it. Everybody might not want it. And it's also an excellent way to keep down dependencies from the core. So maybe maybe your extension depends on, say, an application. So it should only be installed when you have the application. Or maybe it depends on some library that we don't want to always required. <coughs> the original method of extending all this, in, uh, it was tied to this original vision of the universal dealer. So you, you, you replace, you write a new view component for, say, a file type or, or for a folder. But that's not really well, it ends up not being a very good way to extend stuff. Because, say you're wanting to write a CPS view. Now, the CPS view shows a directory and lets you do stuff in CPS. But it also replaces, like, the item view and the list view. So you have to re-implement all of those. If you want the CPS view to be able to rename a file, you have to actually implement a file renaming instead of already using the code that does cloud enabling and all this. So it, it will also look completely different unless you spend a lot of time making sure it looks exactly like no was. And you can't in any way extend existing views. Uh, the original approach also uses Bonobo, which is a very heavy framework. It works okay for, for, for the sort of total replace of the whole content of the window that we're doing originally, but it doesn't work as well if you want to have more fine-grained extension points. And it's also sort of complicated, like out of process communication, and this is a web activation framework where you have a query language to get it to ask for plugins. So we decided to have a radical new approach. It's much simpler, it uses fine-grained extension points. 
So there is a set of places in the current, currently existing views where you as an extension author can extend them. Like there is, you can extend the context menu, so there's a place for that as I hope. And they're all simple shell library plugins. The problem is any shell library, you put them in a specific place, Nautilus will load all those plugins. And then there is a, there's a public interface the library that everything links to that exposes some Nautilus internals, enough that you can write important extensions. So technically, an extension is something called a G-type module, which is some deep magic part of G-object that lets you uh, declare G-types, which is the core types and uh, G-object. lets you declare them in a shared library. So it can be unloaded and typed the other way. So you, you create this G-type module with these three uh, Functions. Initially, they call the term. Initially, and shut down when you unload the extension. And then there's this list types, which is what does most of the work. It, it, it returns a set of types that all this can create. Each of these types is supposed to implement what we call the provider interface. Uh, and, and the provider interface is defined in uh, this library called libnaldus extension, which every extension links to. And, and each type of provider is, is for the one specific extension point that we have. And the provider, most of them work by returning what we refer to as property object, which is just a simple G object that has certain name properties that describe the object you're adding to the UI or whatever. And these all run in the same process in Nautilus. You can crash stuff if you're not careful. You can call blocking IO because that will freeze the whole Nautilus. And the main way that extensions work with Nautilus is using the Nautilus file info object. And a Nautilus file info object represents a file that Nautilus has some interest in in some way. And uh, if you know something about the architecture of Nautilus, it's obvious that it's very similar to an Nautilus file. In fact, it's just an interface that Nautilus file implements. It lets us decide which part of the internal Nautilus we want to expose. So, uh, and these files, just like Nautilus files, will live as long as Nautilus has any interest in the file. So it's a great way to, to limit the scope of caches and whatever you want to do in. in and the, and the file info itself is extensive, extensible using extensions. So you can create an extension called Nolus Info Provider that provides information for the file. You can give extra information. I'm going to describe some of the current or all the current extension points we have. The most simple one menu provider, which is, see these two, start here, and right to this are two extensions. One is from the archive manager, file roller, that detects that file roller can handle ISOs and lets you extract them. The other one is from the all the burner that lets you burn into that to the disk. And you can also, these are uh, added to the, the per file context menu. You can also add stuff to the background context menu. Yet. And uh, you can add stuff to the toolbar, which is in browser mode. So what you do is you get called whenever all this tries to display a, a menu. And you try to return a list of all this menu item objects that you think matches this file you get passed in. You describe the name and the label. But the name is sort of a, it's an internal thing that you use to find the object. But the label is what's displayed in the, in the menu and the icon. 
these objects also have a single, a typical DTK signal that gets embedded when the user actually selects this menu item. So you just connect to that object or that single in the object. Uh, and when it gets emitted, you do whatever you want to do. Another simple type of extension is the property page provider, which lets you add tabs to the property page dialog. So you can add, like this is from the, the Nautilus VCS extension, which has some CBS. It's essentially a CBS view but down in the new system. So you can, you can, well basically all you do is you, you decide whether you want to show something and if you do you can put any sort of DK widget in the dialogue. And then there's the more complicated thing, is the column provider. This adds something we call a column. Not really something you see much of in the user interface. It's something you can show. So a column could be actually displayed as a uh, as a column with a list view. Like this is the version info. Here is you can select that as a visible column. And you can also use them in, in the icon view as extra information under display labels. So the existence of a, of, a, of a column doesn't mean that there's any information in it. It's just basically it adds something to this uh, preference panel where you can select which columns you want to display. And you have an, uh, need to have an actual knowledge info provider that actually generates the information. So the knowledge column refers to an attribute. So you better have a knowledge info provider that adds that specific attribute. So in this case there's actually there's actually two extensions going on there. One is the column that lets you select this, and then there's the knowledge info provider that actually generates the version info displayed in the column. And the uh, info provider can also generate or you can also add emblems, which if you not, I don't think, I don't think there was any emblems in there. But the, the CBS extension also adds uh, emblems to checked out files or, or non checked out files or modif locally modified files and things like that. Uh, and this also works with the mobile system because the IO system, so whenever Nolis decides if it's interested in information, it will get to you. your extension will get called. There's, there's a, one of the methods in the info provider interface is update file info. That will get called when you need information. And when you, when you get called, you're supposed to call all this file info at Edler or at string attributes to add the extra information you, you, you're providing. So if you can do this immediately, you just do it and return operation complete. Or you can also schedule a synchronous I.O. and then eventually uh, and return an operation in progress. And eventually when the, the I.O. finished, you, you store a reference to the, the update complete gene closure, which is basically a type of callback. And then you call that and say, I'm telling you this now. In all this, from the other side, you can also, you can suddenly decide that it's not really interested in this anymore, cancel it, and they, they need to cancel all the outstanding information and make sure you never call this update complete function. Uh, you also have to be careful to keep track of this staleness of the data. If something happens to a file that changes the information you added, you need to validate its extension info. And whenever something changes to a file, Mobus tends, tends to throw away all the extension information and regenerate it. So if you're having
has something that's really expensive to compute, say you need to load, like the CVS directory in the folder. A good way to catch that is, is to use something called weak references on the this file info object, which means that whenever that object goes away, your cache goes away. This is sort of a limited set of extensions that you can do at the moment. We have ideas of what new things we want to let people extend. For instance, we have the sidebars in browser mode. Eventually, we'd like to let you implement your own sidebar objects. And there's also this idea about file previews. We're not exactly sure yet how to implement file previews. File previews. But for instance, KDE does it as a hover thing. So when you hover over an icon, you just like start displaying it, and you start playing it. If it's an M3 file, you can start playing it. If it's an animation, you start playing the animation. We haven't really figured out a great way to do this. The, the, the whole hover thing ends up being sort of irritating. But eventually, we'll find out, figure out a good way to handle this. And then a, a, a great example of plugin would be a, you know, a preview generation extension. Like, so you'd have extensions to play free files and play animations and live and things like that. We also want to split up the column handling a bit. Right now, you can just add columns, and then the user has to manually add them to the user interface. You want to have it so that, say, your CVS column, the version info column, sort of automatically gets used when you're in a directory that has CVS information, but never otherwise. Uh, we need to figure out all the details, but hopefully we can make that work. Because without that, it's very hidden that we support this feature. We're also looking at, at new and better directory views. Tree view is, is used in Mac OS X, it's very interesting. Also, eventually, we wanted to search view. And then for what we get index search. These are not going to be implemented as extension, but I'm pretty sure that they will have lots of places where people want to extend them. And it's also, it's also, we need feedback from people who are interested in doing some kind of extension. And it's very easy to add them, but we're only interested in adding extension points if somebody's actually interested in using them. So if you have a good idea, just come to us and ask us. We'll implement it for you. Um, there's some references to, to documentation mailing lists where you can get information about all this, all this code. Uh, example code, all this VCS is very complicated uh, extension that uses all of the possible things you can do right now. Whereas file roller and all the C are more limited things that just add things to the news. So depending on what you're interested in, one of those could be Interesting starting point. If you have any questions, we're always on hash notes and give that or there's a mailing list, and all this will always list and come on board where you can ask us things. Uh, and so at the end of my schedule talk, so has anybody had any questions? Will I get a million new extensions at this?
right. But no, you have to write the wrapper. But it, it, it does use the, uh, the the object type system a lot, so it's pretty easy to uh, integrate with other other type systems. I mean, it might not be hard to to get the Python thing going because the PyGTK bindings already wrap the object and all the interfaces. And so, yeah, it is very. Yeah. A lot of people have an interest in Python and Mono, so see if there's going to be work on extension uh, on support for those languages. Because I suspect a lot of people would love to write extensions, but unless you're a hardwood C hacker, then. It's, it's quite yeah. difficult to get started.